Okay, so we have seen what the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality is. We will look at uh, some applications of this and also, uh, you know, see how the notion of uh, the scalar product is is quite general. And you know, I'll give you an example of a scenario where this is, uh, you know, it's defined in a, a way which is perhaps unusual, which you have not seen, perhaps. Okay, so for a you know, for a function to classify as a scalar product, right? It's a function of it takes any two vectors and gives out a complex number, right? And it this, this must happen in a in in such a way that certain properties are satisfied, right? We have already stated what those properties are, right? You you know, provided these properties are, are satisfied, you could have many different ways in which this, an acceptable scalar product can be defined. So now suppose we define for you know three dimensional uh, space of vectors we consider this three dimensional space of vectors the standard way in which we would define a dot product is you know just take the components along the x direction along the y direction and along the z direction and then you know take their products and add them up right that's a valid dot product definition it turns out that you can have a much more general uh, definition but this quantity is not going to be invariant when you rotate your coordinate axis. Whereas the, the, the kind of dot product that we're used to, where you think of it as just a1, b1 plus a2, b2 plus a3, b3, it's going to appear the same, no matter, you know, if you do a rotation, if you do certain transformations to your uh, axes, it's going to remain the same. Whereas this is going to, you know, take on a different form if you're in a different a basis, so to speak, right? So, I mean, all of these concepts are, you know, familiar and I'm using them loosely, but we will also define these things a bit more uh, carefully as we go along. But for now, the point is that I'm going to define my inner product between two vectors in this manner, a1, b1, plus half times a2, b2, plus one third, a3, b3, where a1, a2, a3 are three real components of this vector a and b1 b2 b3 are the three real components of the vector b right so what are the prop properties that we have to verify right first of all you know uh, there is this uh, requirement that the inner product of a with b and the inner product of b with a must be complex conjugates of each other which is clearly true here because we're just dealing with real numbers so the inner product of a b is actually equal to inner product of B A because these are all just it's not a com, com, not a generic complex number but a real number so this is automatically satisfied so the next is the distributive property right if you take a vector like C which is a linear combination of some two vectors A and B and then if you take this the inner product of this with respect to some some D right you bring in this bra vector D from the left hand side so then you have these components of D, D1, D2, and D3. So if I invoke this definition, uh, D1, so then I have the vector C itself will now ha have the components, you know, alpha A1 plus beta B1, and then alpha A2 plus beta B2, and alpha A3 plus beta B3, right? So then if I bring, just invoke this uh, definition, I'll have D1 times the stuff plus half times D2 times this, the, you know, second component and one third times d3 times the third component. And now we can rearrange all this and quickly convince ourselves that indeed this is the same as alpha times the inner product of d with a plus beta times the inner product of d with b, right? So the third property of course is if you take the null vector and take a uh, inner product of the null vector with itself, you're going to get zero, right? And the inner product of any vector with itself, right, is uh, a, a is a one squared plus half a two squared plus one third a three squared. All these uh, components are real numbers. So the inner product of any vector with itself will give you necessarily a non-negative number. It's going to be positive unless the vector is a null vector. Then it will be zero. Okay, so. All the three required properties are, are met 
and therefore this is a legitimate scalar product right there are other ways you can play with it you can come up with your own definition of an inner uh, product and see if these three things uh, set, are satisfied these properties then what would you know what would be the cauchy schwartz inequality you're going to look at how the cauchy schwartz inequality plays out with this definition right so the cauchy schwartz inequality just relies on the fact that there is a you know well defined inner product doesn't matter what the precisely how you define it as long as you have an inner product defined you can go ahead and apply the cauchy schwartz inequality which says that if you have two vectors a and b inner product of a b a and b the modulus of this squared is going to be less than or equal to the product of the inner products of each of these vectors right so in this case we'll just uh, you know invoke this general cs inequality and apply it to this inner product so then we see you get a1 b1 explicitly expanding it out a1 b1 plus half a2 b2 plus half one third a3 b3 the whole square is must be less than or equal to a1 square plus half a2 square plus one third a3 square times b1 square plus half b2 square plus one three one third b3 square right so let's see if so this is like a very general sort of result right it doesn't matter what you uh, you know a1 b1 a2 uh, a1 a2 a3 b1 b2 b3 r they just have to be real numbers and this inequality must hold right it looks it's a complicated looking inequality so let's expand these terms out and see if we can you know derive the same result independently all right so cancelling terms and rearranging we have so i mean you just expand out on both sides so you have you know some the sum of three times the whole square will give you a square plus square plus square and then two times the the product of the first two times terms plus two times the product of the second two terms and plus two times the product of the first and the third term that's what will appear on the left hand side and then on this you'll see all the square terms will immediately cancel with you know these uh, uh, diagonal terms if you wish so if i if you multiply a1 squared with b1 squared that's going to cancel with a1 squared b1 squared and likewise if i multiply half a2 squared with half b2 squared that's going to cancel with this half a2 b2 the whole squared and then the third term also cancels and so on right and then you'll be left with if you carefully rearrange all terms right so this is left as an exercise for you all to check you can actually rearrange all these terms bring everything well i will move everything to the right hand side and rewrite this as the sum of three squares there is 1 by root 2 times a1 b2 uh, minus 1 over root 2 a2 b1 the whole square plus 1 over root 6 a2 b3 minus 1 over square root 6 a3 b2 the whole square plus 1 by root 3 a1 b3 minus 1 over root 3 a3 b1 the whole square now this so the claim is that this sum of three squares must always be greater than or equal to zero right which is definitely true because we are dealing with real numbers and the square of a real number cannot be negative the sum of squares of real numbers also can never be negative right so the case where they all become zero is of course when you can verify it will be when you know when they are the uh, null vector um, Oh, well, I mean, you, you, the case when it, they become uh, zero is when, uh, sorry, not when they become the null vector, but rather when they're parallel, right? So this is like one of the, when, uh, when the two vectors are really pointing on the same direction. So then you have on the left hand side, you'll have AA mod squared and on the right hand side also you'll have a uh, the whole square, which is the same as mod square because it's going to be a real number so yeah so the the extreme case appears when the two vectors are parallel to each other you know you can also think about this geometrically there is no question of dropping a perpendicular and so on and if the two vectors are parallel then this equality will hold okay so this was a, a quick exercise in seeing how a you know you can have a non-standard type of uh, Mm, scalar product defined and how the cauchy schwartz inequality plays out in this context and i just want to quickly make one more uh, point 
right? In the, and it will be part of this lecture. Is this notion of an angle, which can be defined between any two abstract vectors, right? So this also can be got from the Cauchy can be uh, um, defined based on the Cauchy Schwartz inequality, right? So the Cauchy Schwartz inequality it guarantees, right? So that this quantity, um, the left hand side. Uh, is less than or equal to the right hand side. So you can bring this whole object AA on the right hand side to the denominator in the left hand side. And then you can think of this overall object, you know, using the analogy from um, Euclidean vectors, three dimensional vectors, you can go ahead and define an angle theta between any two arbitrary vectors as the square root of cosine. You can define this cosine square theta to be this ratio. And then cos theta is, is the square root of this. And since this quantity is always going to necessarily going to be less than, you know, the modulus of this is less than one, so there is a meaningful theta associated with, you know, with this quantity always, right? So it's yeah. So one must use some caution uh, because the notion of inner product itself is not a is not a rigid notion, right? As we have seen, you, there are different ways of defining a scalar product but given uh, you know a definition for a scalar product there is going to be a, a well defined angle between any two vectors right so you have a space of vectors you can take any two vectors find uh, the inner product between them according to one one definition and then the the angle between them is fixed and that is the uh, all the angles between vectors will change to a different number but the qualitative aspects are all going to be the same if you use a different inner product definition. Okay, thank you. That's all for this lecture.